Now that we know about self-attention, we are ready to learn about the encoder used in the transformer. The encoder consists of capital N blocks stacked on top of each other. All of these blocks have the same structure illustrated in this figure, but they have different parameters. Each of these N blocks maintain the shape of the input. That is, for each vector that a block receives, it returns another vector of the same length. Therefore, the number of input and output vectors never changes, and all vectors also have the same length. This makes it very simple to stack these encoder blocks on top of each other. When I say that we stack them on top of each other, I simply mean that they are placed after each other and that the input first passes through the first block, then through the second block, and so on. As you can see, when data enters an encoder block, it goes through a multi-head attention layer. It also goes through a residual connection, and those terms are then added and normalized. After that, there is a simple feed-forward network, around which there is also a residual or skip connection. Finally, we add and normalize again. In this video, we will first describe how the transformer computes the input embeddings for the input data. After that, we will go through all the three different blocks that you can see in the figure, namely multi-head attention, the add and normalize layer, and the feedforward network. Among these components, the input embeddings and the multi-head attention are probably the most novel ones and that's what we will start with. Similar to self-attention, the entire encoder block takes a set of vectors as input and produces another set as output. This is very useful in several contexts, but it's also problematic. For instance, it's easy to see that word order often matters. As an example, consider the following two sentences. They are rich, but are they happy? They are happy, but are they rich? Clearly, these sentences make different statements. But if we only consider the set of words that the sentences contain, they are identical. And this is problematic since the encoder only looks at the input as a set of vectors. Now, there is a simple and elegant solution to this. We can encode the position of the word in the vectors. If we do this for the first sentence, one vector would essentially contain the information rich was the third word in the sentence and some other vector would contain the information happy is the seventh word in the sentence. Once you have added this information to the vectors, you don't need to keep track on how the words are ordered since you can figure this out by looking at the vectors. At least that's the idea. There are several ways to encode positions in the vectors. On this slide, I'll describe one possible alternative. The description will be slightly technical, but I think this may be useful for some of you. To make the description concrete, let's assume that the input sequence is he is happy, followed by an exclamation mark. The first thing we need to do is to map this to a sequence of words in our vocabulary. A technical detail that I've ignored in earlier videos is that we use specific dictionaries for this task. And one reason for this is that computers care about every token in the sentence. In this case, we might obtain a sequence where the first word is he followed by space. The second word is is followed by space and so on. Once we have identified the words, we can produce a sequence of one hot encodings for these words. These are vectors that are zero everywhere except for at one position. For instance, if he followed by space is word number 123 in our dictionary, then T1 would be zero everywhere except for at position 123. Similarly, we could also produce one hot encodings for the word positions. For instance, P1 would be zero everywhere except for the first element, which is one since T1 is the first word in our sequence, whereas the only non-zero element in P2 would be the second element. Now, we could simply concatenate Ti and Pi and use that vector as input, since that would be very informative about the word number i. 
However, that vector would be super long and it would be impractical to use such long vectors in our encoder. What we can do instead is to multiply ti and pi with matrices capital E and capital P to reduce these vectors to some dimension d that we think is appropriate for our encoders. Interestingly, it is common to simply sum up the word embeddings, capital E times ti, and the positional encoding, capital P times pi. Mixing the embeddings like this may seem counterintuitive, but remember that the dimension d is still a fairly large number and the network could simply choose to select capital E and capital P so that position is encoded in some dimension and words are encoded in other dimensions. We also note that capital E and capital P are both wide matrices and since both TI and PI are one hot encodings, this will simply extract one column vector from capital E and one column vector from capital P and then sum them up. Specifically, if the first word, he followed by space, was actually the 123rd word in our dictionary, capital E times T1 would extract the 123rd column vector from E. Similarly, capital P times P1 would simply extract the first column vector from the matrix capital P. In our example, we would do this four times to compute four input vectors x1 to x4. Importantly, both capital E and capital P are matrices that we can learn from data along with all the other parameters in our network. Let us now look at multi-head self-attention, which is the main novelty and the first layer in the encoder blocks. Multi-head self-attention, often referred to as multi-head attention, consists of h-parallel self-attention blocks, or heads, as they are also called. All of these heads perform self-attention as described in the previous video, and they all have the same structure but different parameters, which enables them to look for different things when performing attention. In the toy example to the right, we have n equal 3, which means that there are three input words. d is equal to 2, which means that the word embeddings are only two elements long. The input matrix capital X is therefore 2 by 3, where 2 is the length of our embeddings and 3 is the number of input words. In the example, we assume that H is 3, such that there are three heads. Each head has its own weight matrices, WQ, WK and WV, and in this case, we therefore have nine such matrices with trainable parameters. Given these matrices, we can perform self-attention separately in each head, and this will give rise to H matrices with word embeddings. That is, for each input word, we now have H different word embeddings. These word embeddings are then concatenated, which gives rise to longer word embeddings, one for each word, and we use Y tilde to denote a matrix that contains all the long word embeddings. In the example, we obtain Y tilde by stacking the matrices Y1, Y2 and Y3. The first column of Y tilde now contains the word embedding for the first word. The second column of Y tilde contains the word embedding for the second word and so on. As you can see, these vectors are now three times longer. One could imagine that the output from our multi-head attention layer could be more high-dimensional than the input, but due to the add and normalize layer that follows afterwards, it is easier if input and output have the same dimension. To shorten the word embeddings back to length d, we multiply y tilde with a matrix WO, which is yet another matrix that contains learnable parameters. In our example, WO needs to have the dimensions 2 by 6 in order to ensure that the output Y has dimensions 2 by 3. After the multi-head attention layers, the next layer is called add and normalize. As illustrated in this figure, the layer receives two separate inputs, 
which are the input and output matrices to the multi-head attention layer. Similarly, we have another add and normalize layer after the feed forward layer, and that also receives two separate inputs. Suppose that the inputs are denoted X and Y, and that both are matrices of size D by M. As indicated by the name, the first step in the add and normalize layer is to add the two input matrices. Not surprisingly, the second step is to normalize the matrix that we obtained. To perform the normalization, we compute the average mu of all elements in A. The average is simply obtained by summing all the elements and dividing by the number of elements. We also compute the sample variance, sigma squared, across all elements in A by summing up the squared difference of Aij minus mu and again dividing by the number of elements. Finally, we obtain the output z by normalizing A. That is, we subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, while possibly adding a small number epsilon for numerical stability. You should of course ask yourself why we do this. Without going into too much details, the add function is an example of a residual connection, which often yields better learning due to stronger gradients. In this context, it's also possible that the residual connection helps the network remember the positional encoding. The usual motivation for the normalization is that it enables larger learning rates and thereby faster training by reducing something known as the covariate shift. Normalization also ensures that word embeddings are centered around the origin, which may be useful for the attention layers where we compare inner products. We have now covered multi-head attention and the add and normalize layer. The only remaining layer to describe is the feed-forward network. In this layer, we apply a fully connected feed-forward network to each word embedding. In the illustration below, X is the input and Y the output from this layer, and we again assume that there are only three words in our input sequence. To compute the first output vector in Y, we apply the feed-forward network to the first word embedding. Similarly, to compute the second output vector, we apply the network to the second input vector, and so on. Like all the other layers in the encoder, the input and output matrices have the same dimensions and the weights are shared among all words. Weight sharing is important since it limits the number of parameters and helps the network generalize better to sequences of varying length. The specific feedforward network used in the original transformer paper contains a linear layer followed by a rectified linear unit and another linear layer. We can express this using a single equation as follows. Here, W1 times Xi plus B1 corresponds to the first linear layer. We then compute an element-wise maximum of zero and the elements in that vector, which corresponds to the rectified linear unit. And finally, we multiply the result by a matrix W2 and add a bias B2, which is the second linear layer. Since these operations are performed on one column at a time, we can view them as two consecutive 1D convolutions, which can be useful for coming up with a fast and simple implementation. To conclude, we take the input sequence and produce an input embedding where we add a positional encoding to each word embedding. We then pass the sequence through capital N encoder blocks, which all have the same structure, but their own parameters. Inside each encoder block, we have a multi-head attention layer, followed by an add and normalize layer, a feedforward network, and finally another add and normalize layer. The input and output from every single layer in every encoder block has the same dimensions as the matrix received as input to the first encoder block. We also learned that they can handle long or short sequences, and that you can think of the entire encoder as a function that maps from one set of vectors to another, since the order of the input word doesn't matter.